Hi, everyone, and welcome to the WIM Podcast. Women in Influencer Marketing is a first-of-its-kind exclusive networking group made up of inspirational women. This podcast is where we explore influencer marketing and get real about women in business. Find us wherever you download podcasts, and of course, you can always find us at IamWim.com. That's IamWim, double I, dot com. Hey guys, welcome back to the pod. I am super excited to be here with you guys today for so many reasons. We've got a lot coming up. This episode is a really good one with Kristen Nino de Guzman of Clara for Creators. So stick around for that because our interview was really good. She's fascinating and I really enjoyed my conversation with her. But before we get into this week's episode... We have got a huge, huge event for you next week. I can't believe it came up so quickly. So next week we have our next Best in Influencer Tech event. So you probably have attended these in the past. This is like our, I think it's our seventh one that we're doing. So we've had them before. They're always highly successful. Essentially, if you haven't If you haven't been, essentially, here's what to expect. Um, We have incredible sponsors of this event, which is also keeps it free for you guys. So it's entirely free. Our sponsors come in and they demo the latest and greatest, the best and the newest product offerings from their tech company, all the influencer tech that can help you source creators faster and better and smarter and manage campaigns better. And, um, and also like work reporting. Oh my gosh. Like all of those things that you probably have implemented before and struggled with, they come in and tell you how awesome their product is and how it solves your tech problem. So you could be doing incredible influencer marketing work, but if you don't have great tech to support it, you're going to fall behind. I stand by that. So I hope you guys sign up for this event. I'm telling you it's completely free and it is hugely, hugely valuable for you guys. It's on March 28th. So head to our website now. I'll link it in our show notes, but it's imwim.com slash events. Look for the best influencer tech event. And um, I hope to see you guys. It's going to be so, so good. All right. So our guest today, I know we teased it out before, but um, we've got Kristen Nino de Guzman. She is a Latina creator, a speaker, a tech mentor. She is the founder of the newly launched app Clara for Creators, which is a community that empowers creators through transparency, brand reviews, and discoverability. She's an industry vet. She has almost a decade of experience working with top content creators at social networking companies. She's worked at Instagram, TikTok, and Pinterest, y'all. Like she really knows her stuff. She's a motivational speaker and mentor in the tech space who's passionate about helping people break into the industry through career advice and actionable content. So I am definitely going to be linking all of her social platforms in the uh, show notes below, but she's got like a platform for different topics. So for example, if you, you might know Career Kristen in which on Instagram, she gives awesome career advice for people who work in influencer marketing or who maybe want to work in technology. Um, You could follow Kristen if you want to hear a little bit more about her and behind the scenes of her as like a, a startup founder. Or you can follow Claire for creators and learn more about the company and, you know, things like tips for getting paid more by brands and how much brands are paying creators and things like that. I love that she sort of has them all streamlined. I follow them all. And after listening to her today, I have a feeling you will too. So without further ado, I'm so excited for you to meet Kristen. So first and foremost, big giant welcome from East Coast to the West Coast. Welcome to the show. How's it going today? Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. I know that you have been like talked about in our industry in a really cool way. And I just want to give you props for that first and foremost. I 
I think it's hella cool to be able to like innovate in, you know, our industry and to like keep pushing really important conversations forward. And that's sort of what you've been doing. So first and foremost, I want to give you props. We, we heard a little bit about you in the intro to this podcast, like on paper, but I think a really cool place to start would just to be like, learn about you as a human. So Tell me a little bit more about like your childhood and like how you grew up. I think you're from California, right? Yeah. So a little bit about me. I think, so I I grew up in California. I went to college in Nebraska. So I lived in the Midwest for a little bit. And I remember when I was like a student at University of Nebraska, my major was, was like journalism. So like at the time we were learning about like, you know, marketing, advertising. And I remember um, one day, one of like the original founders of Twitter came to speak to our our class. And apparently he had like dropped out of University of Nebraska. Um, And at the time it was like a huge, big user of Twitter. So I was just like, this is really cool. Like he like left University of Nebraska and like went on to create this like cool app. And in high school, I really started becoming obsessed with social media. I was like very early on, like on Facebook and just like, I think hearing um, him talk in like at my, in my college really solidified the fact that I wanted to work in tech. Like I just was really excited about how it was changing, changing the world. And so when I graduated, I, it was like my goal to work at Facebook. I was like, I have to work at Facebook. And I had done a few things like up until graduation that I really enjoyed. So for example, I did kind of like, I'm sure you've seen, there's so many different like fan pages for like artists and celebrities and things like that. And like the people that run those fan pages are just like really know their stuff when it comes to social and building community. So I kind of like did a little bit of that when I was in high school and college and for like Nick Jonas specifically, I was like working on a, a film that he was making it was like kind of like an indie film and i really started like building community building an audience for like this film and all these nick jonas fans and i was like this is so cool like i i really think i need to like leave where i am move back to california and really pursue this and like the big tech and working in tech i felt like i really had to be in the bay to kind of like you know work at facebook headquarters so I moved to San Francisco. I got a role at a startup company and I really just like started to try to like get myself headed in the direction of Facebook. And obviously Facebook is a super at the time, well, still is, it is pretty competitive to get a role like in one of those larger tech organizations, especially, you know, as someone who is not like Ivy League educated or doesn't have like, you know, I didn't have a 4.0 in college. I, I, put all of my extra effort into like internships. So I I wasn't like focused on academics. I was focused on having four internships my senior year to try to really figure out what I wanted to do. So I moved to San Francisco. I got a role at a startup. And then I kind of like kept getting different jobs to try to get me closer to influencer marketing. And then I got my first official role in influencer marketing at Pop Sugar, which is like media company, very similar to BuzzFeed if you have not heard of it, but they focus mostly on women. And I was working on their influencer program. So like this was back in the day when we were really focused on more traditional bloggers and like all blog, all bloggers were kind of like the same type of of person. A lot of them I worked with were like mommy bloggers or they lived in the Midwest. Um, It's definitely not like the influencer world we have today, but I remember working and just like really like thinking like, wow, is this like a bubble that's going to burst? Like, this is pretty crazy. We're paying all these influencers so much money to post on their page to get free products. And so I worked there and I ended up getting a role, uh, getting recruited for a role at Instagram. And I think once I got that role, I was just like so excited to really be working like at the forefront of the platform that was like making creators. Um, and so I got that role. And then I, I spent a bit of time at Instagram, launched one of their very first creator programs. They were not thinking of creators in the way that I think they do now. I think back then they were very traditional uh, and old school when they thought of marketing at Instagram. And so 
worked on one of their first creator programs, then went to Pinterest. And then uh, most recently I was at TikTok. And then I launched my own, my own app uh, called Clara for Creators, which is essentially like a, a glass door for creators to help them understand pay and how to monetize more efficiently. So I think that's a long-winded answer of kind of like asking of you asking the question of like, how did you get here? I think the, the short answer is I was obsessed with social media. I decided to move to the Bay. I had a couple startup gigs, ended up getting a role at Instagram. And then from there, I felt like I was really able to kind of like use that big name on my resume to get to, to the next big tech company. And then I also became a creator myself during the pandemic. So that's been a fun ride as well. So I'm, I'm really fascinated with all things social, all things influencer and creator, and, and feel like I've been doing this for quite a while now. So you've been taking a vacation for the last few years, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm on sabbatical. <laughs> on sabbatical. <laughs> and, and so... I would love to hear, I mean, you have worked at Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok, like what did you, what was the biggest lesson? What was the biggest takeaway from working at like three of the biggest social media platforms? Yeah. Well, so I want to, I kind of like tease this story, but I want to go back to it because um, prior to me working at Instagram, I had worked at, you know, companies that I was essentially doing brand deals, right? Between Fortune 500 companies and, and creators. And when I got to Instagram, like it was so interesting to me because that is the platform like for creators that all the creators were building their audience on and they weren't leveraging or looking at creators as marketing like vessels. So they were not tapping in, leaning in to like building a community of creators and working with creators to promote like the product features, you know, that they were launching. Instead, they were like doing very old school, very old school things. And so when I got there, I was like, hey, I had come from a background of like, you know, using a creator to sell shoes on Instagram or on a blog. Um, and so when I got there, I built out a program with a colleague that was really focused on working with creators on Instagram to market new Instagram product features. And at the time it was really scary because I like, I mean, I knew creators could market products like effectively, but I wasn't sure if like digital products, it would have the same result. So um, I think the most surprising thing of like working at, at Instagram back in the day, this was 2017, was that like, they just were not even like in the mindset of like, seeing creators as like the future of, of marketing, of advertising. And I think, you know, it was a big deal that I had, that me and a colleague had to propose this program where we actually like lean into the people making platform on the, the people making content on Instagram to market new Instagram product features. And I think looking back, it's so interesting because now you look at Instagram and they have creator programs around like diverse identities. They have all of these like giant events and millions and millions of dollars that they're pouring into, you know, reels, bonuses. But like at the time, they were just not seeing like how incredible like creators could be for their for their platform and, and building community. So I think the most interesting thing is like, I think it really took them a while to kind of like, I think for the, the light to go on and them to really understand that creators are the future and they've built They've built a lot of careers on their platform, but they weren't really leaning into that. Um, so I think that was probably the most interesting thing of like starting my role there was like, it took a lot of convincing, right? You had our CMO that was like maybe like forties or fifties and like were, was very leaned into traditional old school marketing. And it took a lot of convincing and a lot of, of proof of that, like, Hey, proof of concept, this can work and you should lean into it. Um, and then now you look at where they are and they have like these worldwide creator programs. So I think it was a really interesting time to like be in tech and, and be working with creators because not everyone kind of believed what the future would look like. And I think now it's so crazy because it's like everything is all creator centric. Every platform has, has an intense, you know, creator strategy, monetization, all of these things that they're rolling out. But just a few years ago, it was, that was not the case. And I think that's so important. I love that you brought that up for a million reasons. One of them just to see like in such a short period of time, 
how much can change, you know, like they recently announced, you know, that meta is going to be like joining the ranks of, you know, Reddit and Twitter and like on YouTube where they're going to be chart, they have a, a subscription model for creators or for businesses so that if they opt into it, they could get, you know, they could get a verified check mark. They can get a verified check mark. They can get um, additional reach. They can get chat support. And, you know, some people are up in arms about it. It's like a very polarizing thing. And I think like without even getting into how you feel about it, how our audience feels about it, what it is showing to me to parlay it back into the, your, your, your comment is things can change. And, you know, don't be surprised if, you know, forever Instagram has been free and all of a sudden, if you want certain things, well, they've been free for a long time and have allowed a lot of influencers to make millions of dollars. And now they're asking for their piece of it and things are changing in a way that maybe nobody ever expected and how interesting that is. And sort of all fair game. It's their company. <laughs> they can do whatever they want. So, uh, you know, speaking of, you know, businesses and, you know, like I, I would love to hear how you went from working at, you know, Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok, having these incredible experiences, being like such a, a role model for women in tech, you know, and then you decided to launch Clara and to go out on your own and become an entrepreneur. Like, Walk us through the mentality of that because I, I know that that transition is – it's not something that you do at the drop of a hat. I, like what was that like in reality and, and what, you, what got you there ultimately? Yeah. I mean I think the, the, the pure and like honest answer is that I, again, going back to like was obsessed with social – had this awesome career working at Instagram and I, I was at Pinterest and then like – TikTok started kind of really just, you know, being like the sexy new app. And I think for me, having worked with creators for so long, I was really obsessed with how TikTok was making kind of like 2023 20, version of fame more accessible, right? Like, because before it was kind of gatekept, like I felt like, and I used to think this all the time, I, I wish I would have started making content five years ago, right? Because now those people are, have such a big audience, but all of a sudden it was like with TikTok, you didn't need to have worked, you know, five years on your blog. Like you could make one video and, and get an audience overnight. And I like, I just like love that because it, it felt like fame and like all this stuff was not being gatekept. Um, it was more about talent and anyone could find an audience if they just were entertaining and interesting. And so, and it didn't matter, like they didn't have to have fancy camera equipment. They literally could have an iPhone and be in their car and, you know, gain millions of followers. So I saw that TikTok reached out to me a role about a role in Los Angeles. I had been wanting to, to move to, to LA because that's where most of my family is. So I moved from the Bay to LA, got this role. And I was managing thousands of creators during my time at TikTok. I would manage like ones with like 30 million followers. I'd also manage smaller creators. And every day, like in working with these top creators and, and my role there was like basically like growth strategy. So I would help educate them on how to use TikTok, how to grow on TikTok, how to grow as a creator. And every day I'd get the question in my inbox from like thousands of creators, like, there'd probably be at least a handful of these a day saying like, Hey, how much should I charge? Or I just gained 200,000 followers last week from this video. Like, and now I have like Netflix reaching out to me, like, what should my rate be? And it was always so conflicting because, you know, obviously I, I can't tell them what their rate should be, but then also, you know, I started creating content and what I realized is I was getting brand deals and I didn't really know like what the standard was. And with my role in all these companies, I would constantly be, you know, CC'd on brand deals between big companies, you know, asking creators, like, what's your rate? What's your rate for a TikTok? What's your rate for an Instagram? And the responses from creators were literally like, if it was like a, a, a chart, like you would have one saying, my rate's 20,000 for a video. And then another would be like, maybe it was like their first ever, the first time an, a brand ever reached out to them. And they would be like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Uh, I'm just going to say $500. So you would have like these major like disparities in between rates. There was really no consistency. And a lot of times, I, you know, I'd talk to the creator, but like, 
hey, you can charge more. And they were kind of like, what? I can charge more? And their mind was like blown. Um, and I just realized like there was influence on marketing and and big brands working with creators was just now becoming the new thing. And I felt like future of work was changing. All these creators I worked with were able to leave like their jobs and become full-time creators. And I just realized like there was really not a database that had existed that was available for people to go and see, you know, how much other creators are being paid. And I, I thought of myself when I was getting a role at TikTok, you know, when they're asking me how much money do I want to make a year in my position, I was able to reference different sites like Glassdoor to understand, you know, what, what is a fair salary? What is like market? What is my market value in this position? Like how much does TikTok pay? What is their range? And then how much can I charge? Right. Otherwise I, I would go into a negotiation. Just, I'm not going to throw a random number out because then TikTok might be like, you're crazy. Or I might be getting low bald. And I felt like that ex that resource needed to exist for creators even more so because creators are getting deals weekly, sometimes daily. And if they don't have some sort of resource where they can see, oh, Netflix just paid a creator my side, my size 10K last, last week, I should probably ask, and maybe I've only been charging a thousand, I can get maybe eight, nine, 10K for, for this video. So I was seeing the problem firsthand every day. And then also as a creator, I was seeing it for myself because I was having brand deals. So I just knew I was like, I need to create some sort of app and, and platform for people to really just have as a resource to see how much brands are paying with the hope that, you know, I could reach the people that need it most who don't have agents or managers and who are really just advocating for themselves and just really, just really get the information out there. I love that. And, you know, it's even, I think that I've personally seen managers and talent agents use it as a resource too. So I think that, you know, transparency of information is valuable for anyone who will raise their hand and, and, you know, and go out to get it. It's just going to improve the conversation because it's just, it's like, it's pulling down the veil and it's just giving people sort of like a voyeuristic look into all things pay. And like, you know, it's interesting that influencer marketing is such a female dominated industry. And it's interesting because, I don't know, I'm making a broad generalization, of course, but I feel like women generally can struggle talking about how much do you make? How much am I making? Like, it's just an uncomfortable conversation for a lot of people. So to be able to like, say, look, go to this destination, go to Clara, you guys even have an app too, which I love, <laughs> like go to Clara and just like, see it for yourself, I think is a really powerful thing. I do, you know, I have also like, what would you say to some folks who have checked you guys out and say like, you know, is a big question, is this the complete picture? You know, because mm -hmm. I can imagine that some people might go there and say like, all right, let's see what it is. Like maybe from the brand side, right? Yeah. And they'd be like, okay, so like this influencer, yeah, sure. She was paid, you know, 10 times more than this one, but there's more to why we arrived at that number. How do you guys tackle that? How do you guys respond to, to that? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good question. I think there's, there's definitely those, I think there's times when I personally have witnessed deals where like there, there was no rhyme or reason why someone was getting paid. It was simply, you know, no, I don't think not malicious intent from the brand, but they ask creator what their rate is. If someone comes back and says a thousand, they're like done deal. And if someone comes back and says 10,000, they're like, okay. So it's like, it's not always, I mean, in, in my opinion, it's like, it's kind of like a, to the creator to help educate themselves. And of course, ideally, you know, the brand should in a perfect world have some sort of like, uh, I would say more ethical approach from the way that they're paying creators. So maybe they put in place a baseline. They're not going to pay any creator under $5,000 or X, Y, and Z. But I think my, the purpose with Clara is definitely to your point. It's like, take the information with a, a grain of, of salt, right? The same way like Glassdoor, I can see someone's salary in the same position. I might not know how many years experience they had or maybe that they came from Meta to TikTok, right? Because that would influence the pay. I think the way to look at Clara is the same approach of like, there's a caveat, right? So you can see maybe a creator your size got paid 10K 
Um, so that can help you as you go into your negotiations. But obviously, there's a lot of things that can go into a rate. Maybe that creator was paid that much because they also asked for a year of usage and things like that. So it's more of just like a resource in a creator's toolkit. Maybe you have your own standard rate that you always use, right? For example, I, I ch tend to charge like 3000 a video for a video on TikTok, right? But if I'm able to go to Clara and see like Netflix just paid a creator smaller than me 5K, then I can like use that information to kind of negotiate my rate based off if there was no app to really help guide them, then maybe I'm leaving like 10 times like money on the table. So I think the, the goal is to kind of like, there's so many cool apps out there, some that help you calculate your rate, some that, you know, like Clara that help you, that help to show you what other brands are paying. I think it's all like, just put all these apps in your toolkit. And then as a creator, really kind of hopefully these will all help you make informed decisions and monetize more effectively. But it's definitely like, to your point, not a situation where you just want to see the rate and go, okay, this person got 10 K I'm going to ask for that. I think there's a lot of factors that go into a rate. And I think, you know, what I want to do is just help with transparency and, you know, give creators access to that information because I think before it felt like everything was just talked about in silos. Um, you know, I, I would only talk to the creators I know. And then, as I worked with communities at TikTok, I would see, you know, Hispanic creators only talking to Hispanic creators. And so if Hispanic creators are getting underpaid and only talking to each other, it's just like not going to really help the disparities. So the, the goal of the app is like, let's just get the information out there. Uh, let's get more transparency because the industry desperately needs it. I appreciate the heck out of that answer. Like, thank you. I, I, that's sort of like what I was hoping that you might say. I had no idea, of course, but you know, look, I, I like to provide another, another, um, resource in your toolkit to say like, well, if net, we keep using Netflix, but you know, shout out to Netflix, you know, Hey, Netflix paid another influencer of my size, ten, you know, five times more maybe like just, just knowing that like that budget is there. Right. Yeah. So like, maybe it's not going to be one post because maybe my engagement is less, but maybe saying like, all right, like I'm going to hope that maybe I can add in a few more things to get to that number simply because I know that that number is available. Like that alone is powerful. There's so many different ways that you can just utilize it, but you can, you have the information now to utilize. And that in of itself is a huge, huge thing. My last question for you for today, how can more women work in tech? I, I think that a lot of people are, you know, going to listen to this podcast and be like very um, in awe of everything that you've achieved. And, you know, how can some women follow in your footsteps, get into that side of things? What would you tell them? Yeah, I think so I think being a woman in tech, like breaking into tech always like felt really hard and almost impossible for me. Like when I thought of my end goal of Facebook and when I was graduating college, like I was like, this doesn't seem like it's ever going to happen for me. And I remember just like sitting in my apartment in San Francisco, applying to countless jobs and I would get so many rejections from them, like auto rejections. Like I knew my stuff wasn't even breaking through to like the recruiter. And looking at the people that work there, right, they had all graduated from a really good college and a lot of them were men and a lot of them, you know, were well connected. And so I, I tried to think of like, I think we all get like really caught up in like the big dreams of like, I want this now, but I tried to put myself on a path to like get closer to that end goal and recognize like it was going to take a little bit of time, uh, like laying down the foundation to kind of like really get the, the role that I wanted. And then once I got the role I wanted, it was like, I was getting hit up and recruited from all the big tech companies. So I think the things that I did in the beginning that I would recommend to anyone is like working in startup companies. There's obviously like, there can be a lot of risk associated with startups, right? Because well, in general, right now, tech is a little, there's a lot of layoffs happening. But I think with startup roles, they're a lot easier to get into because there's not as much competition as like the Googles and the Instagram getting that big name. Um, but you can get roles that will be kind of like really closely aligned to 
maybe let's say, for example, at Instagram, I worked on the brand marketing team. And so like during my roles at startups, I was doing marketing and I was doing influencer marketing. And so I was able to kind of get my foot in the door, work at an app, work at a startup without having that big name. And then slowly but surely, like my experience became more and more relevant. And then I was able to like land on that big role. And then I think the second, the second thing that truly I don't think I did a good job of this, but I definitely see a lot of people uh, reaching out to me and like networking. I think the networking can be so effective when done right. Um, And then like the caveat is like done right because I don't think most people do it right. But I think that a lot of times, and especially for me, like graduating college, I would just like reach out to people at these big companies and like immediately kind of like ask for a favor or like ask if they could help me get my foot in the door and all this stuff. And I think one of the things that a lot of people, and I I do way better job of doing it now than I did when I first graduated, but like really looking, they they say your your network is your net worth. And I really think looking at every relationship that you make in a professional like setting as like a really long-term relationship, as opposed to like short-sighted and like what favors can this person do for me? So for example, like, if you're graduating college, you want to work at a Google, really trying to like slowly network, whether that's go to events like in your city, Google and all these big companies typically host a lot of like networking type events and really kind of like marketing, even like, you know, women in influencer marketing, like I'm sure there's like a community there that's, you know, really top people tap into. And I think like even kind of like nurturing those relationships and taking them slow over time. Um, And so something I think is really effective is like reaching out to people maybe that have your dream job or work at your dream company for coffee chats or like a Zoom chat um, and really kind of slowly but surely building a relationship over time. I think a lot of times when we're like younger in our careers, sometimes we think like, well, what can I possibly offer? Like, the CMO of like Netflix or Meta. And I think a lot of times like there's not much that you can offer, but what you can do is like support them. And I think like, you know, whether it's like liking their LinkedIn posts, tweeting to them, Twitter is like very highly effective tool to kind of like build community with with people who are more senior at, at companies because they definitely see tweets that come into them. So it's really just kind of like supporting in whatever way that you're able to, whether that's liking posts, um, sharing, like maybe you saw an article online and you, you share it with someone and really kind of like building a relationship over time. And then, you know, long-term, maybe you do have, maybe that person posts a job that you're interested in and you can reach out to them and ask them, you know, if they have any advice for you because you're applying for the role. But I think when I first graduated school, I really looked at networking as like short-term like short-term gain, like, let me reach out to this person. I think that's really not how it works. It's more of a marathon than a sprint. So really thinking of like, how can I make sure that in five years from now, I like still have a a relationship with this person, even on a professional level. Uh, Because ultimately, I think you probably know this super well, that the influencer marketing industry is small. It feels big, but it's small. And I have worked with the same people at different companies and the interns that I worked with like five years ago now are a lot of times managers or like directors. So it's really important that you nurture and like maintain relationships as best as you can and like be kind to everybody. But I think my biggest tips for like women in tech is look at startup roles because uh, a lot of them might be the next big app, might be the next big thing. You can get a lot of experience, wear multiple hats and not confine yourself. So it's also a really, a really good opportunity as you're new in your career to understand what you like doing. And then those can help set you up for a larger role in tech. And then the second piece is really just the networking and really looking at every relationship as more of a long-term relationship. You want it to feel like double-sided, right? You don't want to to feel like you're just kind of like leeching off the person or trying to to take their energy. So I think those two things would would be my top recommendations on like if you want to get a job in influencer marketing, in tech in general, like definitely don't sleep on those things. And then I think there's one more piece. I think because this is the influencer marketing like industry, I think it's also important in my opinion that you kind of make yourself a voice in in the community and I think 
there's so many outlets that you can do that. You can do that on LinkedIn. You can do that on Twitter, just by tweeting your thoughts to things. Like everyone has kind of like their own area of expertise. If you've been working in influencer marketing for a year, I'm sure you've seen a lot of things and have a unique perspective that a lot of people do not. Um, and I think it's really just being open and um, not being afraid to share your perspective and your two cents. And that's how you become a thought leader. That's how you might get opportunities um, and you know be asked to speak at events is because you have a unique perspective. So I would say despite, don't worry about how like young you are in your career. And I think really kind of making yourself the thought leader that you know, you hope to be in 10 years, you can probably do that in a year with social media if if you tweet or share a unique point of view. So I think it's really just like leaning into those three areas. I mean, you are speaking my language. I co-sign everything and you said it so well. I like those, that's good advice. I, everybody listening, like re-listen to the last few minutes because that was really good advice. So look, so for everyone listening now who wants to support you and prop you up and respond to your content and like engage in that conversation, where can they follow you? Yeah. I mean, I think, look, my biggest thing is like, and I'll, I'll just say this because like, I never pictured myself as like an entrepreneur. That's not like what I was out to do. I think what happened was there was a problem I saw in my role at, working at Instagram, TikTok that I like could not ignore any longer. And I felt like I had to help fix it. And so I think that if people want to connect with me, um, I have like my personal Instagram, which is just at Kristen, C-H-R-I-S-T-E-N, or we can connect on LinkedIn. I'll pretty much connect with anyone. Just send me a note like saying that you saw me uh, on this. But I think also just like the, the one thing that's really important to me is um, transparency and creator economy, right? So that's why I launched Clara for Creators. So if there's ever a, a time when, you know, a creator like doesn't know what to charge, um, consider Clara for creators like a resource in their toolkit and in your toolkit. I didn't actually get to mention this, but another big reason why I launched Clara was because I felt like the brands needed the transparency as well. And I think that without transparency, like the brands can improve. And I think as we all know, working in this industry, a lot of times the brands have unrealistic expectations. They're not held to um, the same standard because they don't really understand how they're being perceived by creators. And so the, the main reason why I launched it, it was also so brands could have more visibility and how they should be improving their relationships with creators, right? Creators want to be paid on time. They want to be treated with respect. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of getting people to see influencers and creators as like a legitimate profession. It's kind of crazy because a lot of people not in this industry don't really understand how much creators are being paid, how much they're transforming, just like the marketing industry. So I think for me, um, I would love to also connect on Clara for creators. We have a TikTok, we have um, an Instagram page. And if you know you working in your job need access to rates or wondering what brands are paying creators, definitely check out um, our app or our site. And I welcome suggestions on how to make it better. If you're working like at an agency or if you're working with a brand and you're like, oh, I wish that the app had this so that creators could see usage rights or they could see XYZ. I welcome that feedback and I want it to be a, a resource that is helpful to everyone, both the brands and the creators. I love that so, so much, Kristen. I hope that everyone follows all of your platforms because you have quite a few and I, I love that each one's like a little bit different. So we're going to link all of them in the show notes. I want to support you and what you're doing. I'm like a big fan. I think I very respect, very much respect what you're, what you've been creating and I love it. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. If you enjoyed this episode, we got to have you back. Check out our website for more ways to get involved, including all the information you need about joining our collective. You can check out all the information at IamWim.com. Leave us a review, a rating, but the most important thing that we can ask you to do is to share this podcast. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week. Tune in next week.